I humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Siva Sankaran, Guru Piran Myo, fellow Nyanis. Um, today I'm going to continue uh, Mahan's uh, chapter 16, which is on economics. It's a, a very important part of human behavior. And in the last uh, two classes, I spoke about how economics, which is a part of human behavior of buying, consuming, you know, uh, producing, all those things. And we see that it is an integral part of human life because that's what gives us existence and, you know, so, you know able to uh, have jobs, create the necessary wealth to sustain our material bodies and also our families. And what we see is that I spoke about the evolution of uh, we as a being from nomadic right up to more sophisticated markets, sophisticated technology. And in the last uh, uh, class, I spoke about how over the many years since industrialization that we have focused so much on economic development, but we have polluted nature and we have, have had an adverse impact on the environment. And here in this chapter, Swamiji speaks about how the economics of value uh, and how we should discard the things that harms and do not create value and harness the things that are creating value to ourselves, our communities, and the environment. And Swamiji gives a lot of emphasis on the environment because environment is core to our own being. Now, when we take a spiritual journey, we have to see everything in a very wholesome way. Oftentimes, most people are focused on the rituals, but not on the substance of what that spirituality is. Most people are focused on the acharas, but not on the vichara, on how you know, what is this thing called life? How do we, you know, function in this life? How do we manage things? How do we manage crisis? How do we, you know, harness the good things that are happening, the things that support you? And how do we, you know, manage change? And, and uh, everything is changing in this material world, as we know, as we have done in all the previous satsang. The only constant is change. And in this material world, there is a changing substratum that is supported by a changeless substratum. And I think if some of you all were for reading the satsang on the WhatsApp, I speak about this duality of changing and changeless. Finite and the infinite. Mortal and the immortal. Perishable and the imperishable. There's a duality in all of this, right? And uh, I also spent some time on speaking about this thing called Maya or illusion that some people call it. Is it really illusion? But having said that, today I want to continue from where I left off last Thursday, where we see that a lot of our development is tied to, you know, has had an adverse impact on um, the environment. And we as spiritual beings, we should actually be very conscious of whatever we do, we cannot harm nature because nature is part and parcel of us. We would not harm our families. You know, we would not harm our loved ones. But yet we harm that which supports us the most, which is the environment. And how do we live a spiritual life? How do we change our mindset? Right? To, to live a more humane, more you know, uh, sustainable life. And that's part of the spiritual journey. So here, I'm going to talk, summarize what we had, some of the challenges as society. So this makes us reflect very carefully as a spiritual being on are we value adding to society and the environment? Or are we harming it? Unknowing to us. Sometimes we harm the environment. So part of the spiritual journey, and I've seen this in Mahan, 
that he is very nature centric. He always likes a lot of trees and plants and you know, whenever there's a space, he says, why don't you grow a plant or something like that, right? So he was very nature centric. He takes his walk in the morning in the garden and in the evening and he, he sees oneself, his, himself as one with nature. And I didn't understand for many years until later part when, when we are part and parcel of nature, when you go for a walk, when we sit down, you know, with trees and so on, you see that our meditation and our oneness becomes more and more profound. So here, uh, here are some of the key challenges I spoke about. With all the developments that we have, we have a lot of pollution, you know. We have, we throw things in our rivers, we throw a lot of garbage, you know, we pollute the environment. So as spiritual beings, we should be more conscious. Do we recycle in our homes, the plastics, the paper? Do we throw things in the garbage in, in, that is not supposed to be there? Do we throw things in the drain? You know, all these are part of the spiritual uh, journey that we take on with nature, right? So we see that most people sometimes are very religious. There's a lot of religiosity, but they are not nature centric. And this completely defies that spiritual journey that one takes. So whenever we, we try our best not to pollute or damage the environment, and that's part of that spiritual journey. Next time you use plastic, think of, is there any biodegradable? Next time you are traveling, how do we minimize or how we use you know, uh, environmental friendly things? So part of being, uh, you know, uh, and nature centric. Here it is again, you know, with humanity has been destroying nature uh, significantly. And I spoke about how, so, you know, part of the thing is that try at least to plant trees in your home, you know, nurture them, create a lot of greenery near your home. And, you know, uh, wherever there is space, plant some trees, right? This is something that is very common in Malaysia. Every place where we see empty space, we throw garbage, we throw plastic. All these actually have an adverse impact. This is not being spiritual at all, right? So in societies, they're very religious, but yet they dump a lot of things. It's not, it, not in congruence with the spiritual journey, you know? So again, we have to be very conscious. This is what I mean by oneness, right? Flooding and all this has so all our actions have led to flooding and a drought and forest fire. And this is something that is we see it every day, you know. And as I was telling, I'm a climate change refugee. In the last 12 months, my home was flooded, right? So, and with uh, global warming, we are starting to see uh, nature's reacting. I remember. Nature doesn't need us. We need nature. And this is what part of that spiritual journey is, you see. So, and I showed you this, that we are moving up, you know, we have one hand planetary health, the other one is economic development. We are moving up on the wrong end of the curve. We are moving up economic development, but we are neglecting the health of the planet. When we neglect the health of the planet, a simple example, if you don't keep your house environment clean, you throw garbage everywhere, your neighborhood will have a lot of dengue uh, cases, you know, will have all kinds of uh, pests and, you know, things that ultimately comes and harms one. So, so, so again, we see that as we improve economically, we as human beings or homo sapiens have actually destroyed the health of the planet. And how do we, and May, Mahan speaks about this in the book, you know, how do we change this, this mindset, this values-based mindset? So how do we break this cycle, right? How do we, part of that spiritual life is breaking this cycle of using things, abusing things, you know, and people, using and abusing people, taking things for granted. Spiritual life is about, you know, appreciating everything, respecting everything, you know, having Tremendous, profound respect and reverence for nature and, you know, and, and, and people around us that support us, like how nature supports us, 
we should have reverence and respect for nature. For the people that support us, like our parents, we should have respect and reverence for them. Our families, our spouses, our partners, our children. And you see that in the articles that I've been writing in the WhatsApp on the Universal Adapter, I cover every facet of our lives in how we lead that spiritual life. So here, uh, in this case, how do we break that cycle? Right? So it starts with us. If we don't do recycling, if we don't look after nature, our children will not do it because they will learn from us. Right? So that is also a spiritual uh, thing. If, if you see that you, sometimes you go to places of worship, they worship, but yet they throw garbage, they, they litter things, and that's not spiritual at all. It's not congruent to actual teachings of that, whatever that, that uh, you know, uh, uh, people that, that they, are, they are, you know, uh, are praying to. So part of the spiritual life is to be connected, to be one, to be ensuring that, you know, we maintain cleanliness, so this is something I want to tell you, part of the spiritual journey of taking Mahan's teachings of the universal identity. This is a very nice article that came out uh, in, the, in one of the major journals. It shows that at one hand, planetary health, the health of the entire planet, you know, if we don't look after the planet, the health of everything, the animals and the people are impacted. And the global health is impacted. Ultimately, it impacts all of us. And a classic example is COVID. You know, COVID was actually a man-made virus because we went into destroyed the forests. You know, the, the viruses that were dominant in animals jumped into human beings. And ultimately, we had a huge pandemic where millions of people died. And we all had to be quarantined. So we see that Part of the spiritual life is that, that planetary health, you know, and the health of the people, health of, you know, the, everything around us. So we see that. So when we see challenges of society, and Mahan writes it very nicely, he says that when the biodiversity, when the, the, the whole world's nature has a biodiverse environment, and when we go in and destroy it with our own actions and so on, it creates you know, climate change. So there's a chain reaction that happens. We have economic impact, we have COVID, and ultimately it comes to us. So here it is. This is at the macro level. At the more micro level, when we don't have diversity in our thought, when I mean diversity, when we have a very narrow dogmatic way of looking at things, it impacts us. It, it impacts our outlook on life. It makes our mind very shrunken. And you see that all the other impacts take place. So there is a macro sense of diversity. And when that breaks down, it has a ripple effect across. The same way, when our mind is not universal and diverse, and it becomes narrow, this is what it says, that shrunkenness, karpanya dosha. That means that shrunkenness that leads to that unillumined state. When that happens, we see that all the crises that you know, it's not there will start emerging. All the demons that were never there starts emerging. So we see that this whole notion of universality, diversity, nature is already built in. And then we, we disrupt it with all kinds of conditioning. We see that ultimately we pay that price. So we see, so I like this, this cartoon that tells, although at the macro level, at the, at, at, yeah, the individual level, when our diversity in thoughts, you know, I'm always so fascinated when I see in the WhatsApp and in many, many forums that if you are a Hindu, you put up all the Hindu good things. If you are a Buddhist, you'll put up all the Buddhist things. If you are, so if you are in a particular religion, you want to showcase that. But I've never not seen many people who, who are of different races and different religions, not many of them there are, that takes and highlights, hey, I found this in this place, and I found that in that the diversity of thought is very, very rare. And, and, and one person we saw was Mahan. Mahan said it very clearly. You know, all the truths are that one truth, right? And so, uh, so again, it's really fascinating whenever I see somebody post something, 
you see that something about their own, uh, you know, uh, race or religion. So, but a more universal person will take it from, as a matter of fact, they take the universal spiritual values. You don't know which branch of, 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 of religion it comes from. It's so universal. So in that same way, when our mind is universal and diverse, we see that this is what I mean, the, the universal adapter that is able to plug into all the knowledge, access all the knowledge and use it in different, different ways, in different, different contexts. So here it is. So I start off with this trade-off between planetary health and economic development. Can we do better than this? And this is what Mahan taught me. So this idea came from Mahan's teaching. Mahan said so you have to balance between nature and our what our wealth creation. And this is beautifully captured in the four folds of Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. You have to have a Dharmic mind, a mind that is universal, a mind that is diverse, a mind that is resilient, a mind that is responsive, right? When you have the dharmic mind, you see that you have artha, you're able to create all the wealth without jeopardizing or diminishing it, uh, anything else. So the artha here is all the 10 capitals from the spiritual capital right up to emotional, mental capital. And I covered that in my previous uh, satsangs. So you have a comprehensive, wholesome wealth that you're able to create. So there's not there's competing wealth. And you have that dharma, the karma is that you're able to divinize all your aspirations, desires, you know, and wants and needs. And ultimately, you attain that moksha, that enlightened state. So here, I try to put it in a framework where the planetary health and economic development need not compete with one another, what we call zero-sum game. You can actually move the curve up. That means both the health of the planet and economic development can thrive. So that means that whatever we do, we need to safeguard the planet, safeguard nature. And when we do that, we safeguard our human health and the natural systems that underpin. Natural systems here is so important. It's not just the natural system of the earth and the universe. There's a greater spiritual divine force that underpins all this. And if we understand this, we see that we will be very conscious of what we do. And this planetary health is actually safeguarding both, you know, being able to find the kind of mutually beneficial, you know, approach to living a nature-centric life. And that's what spiritual life is about. You don't go against nature, you go with the flow of nature. And that's what harmony is, right? So it's not moving up the curve where, you only focus on economic development at the expense of nature, but you actually weave in whatever you do with, you know, with, with the nature-centric mindset. What that means is that everything that we do, we, we recycle, we make sure we grow green things. You know, we make sure you use nature-based approaches using renewable energy, you know, really protecting the environments that we live in, the homes that we live in. You know, the more plants you plant, you see that the more oxygen you, you get in your home. So part of that planetary health is actually, it looks so grand, but actually it's small things that we do. We recycle, you know, we make sure that, you know, all the batteries that we use, we don't throw it in the garbage, don't throw it in the drain, send it for recycling, teaching our children, planting the trees. All these are part of that spiritual journey that, Swamiji speaks about. And that means that if every individual homes can do it, then we see that we have a better planet. You know, at least we have contributed to nature itself. So all this is that you, you can do meditation and all these things, but ultimately if your actions are not in congruence with what you are, you know, meditating and, and you know, uh, thinking about, then it's, it's of no, no, no use at all. So we try our best to be as nature-centric as possible, right? And what that means is that in a broader sense that we see that, you know, we have this, this sustainable development goals. And actually the sustainable development goals for me is the spiritual development goals. What that means is that we make sure that we get the dharma, the knowledge that overcomes poverty, hunger, gives us good health, good education, you know, Make sure there's proper 
the gender equality and equity among people, not discriminate people, make sure we look after our waterways and sanitation, you know, ensure that, you know, we use clean energy and not the energy that pollutes, ensure that we create better work, decent work, not work that contributes to adverse things to the, uh, the, the nature or jobs that are sinful, that create sustainable economic growth. Make sure that our industries are innovative and creative, you know, reduce inequalities between the rich and the poor, ensure that the cities that we live in are smart and sustainable, you know, so that we don't pollute, we don't create, you know, dengue and all the other pandemics. Make sure that we, we consume in a responsible way and produce things in a responsible way. Don't waste things, you know? And don't, uh, you know, sometimes people waste, cut trees, and then they dump it. That's not spiritual. Make sure that we have, you know, we look after our climate. Any changes to the climate impacts not only us, but also others and the future generation. Looking after our rivers and oceans, looking after our land, don't dump things in the landfills that, you know, all the pollution creeps in. Foster peace, justice, and strong institution that can help nurture and develop. And more importantly, you know, work in collaboration and partnership. You know, don't separate people. All these are sustainable development values. All these are core to the spiritual values that Mahan speaks about. All these are core to all the spiritual values that you find in all the scriptures and all the masters. And it's come down in a very practical way. Right? So for me, living a spiritual life is trying to, to do our best to address some of this, either directly or indirectly. If we can't contribute to any one of them, we should try not to you know, adversely uh, you know, impact them. And this is what part of that overall uh, you know, living a spiritual life. So coming back to Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha is that Dharma is actually about this mindset, this values-based mindset that nurtures all these qualities that makes life an awesome and a spectacular life, you know, a life that is, you know, contributes to nature, contributes to society, contributes to community, lift up people that are last, least, and lost, you know, and inspire people. You know, I always say that, you know, whenever people ask me how you feel, I feel inspirational because, you know, the more inspirational you are with your thoughts, with your speech, with your actions, that itself is spiritual. You don't need to read many, many things or, you know, uh, do many, many rituals. That in itself is the whole idea of doing everything, all the rituals is to come to that state of having an awesome, beautiful, inspirational thought, speech, actions in life. Right, and uh, if you can do that, you don't need to do anything else, right? And you see that, you know, the discovery of self becomes so much more easier. And this is what Mahan has been telling everybody. So for me, the sustainable development goals, which I work on now a lot in my own work, is the spiritual development goals, right? In action, this is spiritual, you know, spirituality in action. So having said this. I just want to summarize that what all this means is that, you know, nature has given us everything. Nature, you know, <laughs> in one of the capital, I speak about the nature, natural capital. Nature may not have given us all, everybody, everything, but nature has given us something, each one of us something. And it is for us to discover that. But the discovery requires an inward search, that inward movement. You know, in Tamil we say kadavul. Kada means embark. Gul means within yourself. Only through that journey, one will be able to understand one's purpose in this life, the meaning of life, and that which nature has put something special in all of us that is embedded. And when we harness it, we see that the awesome beauty of nature just emerges. And this no, but when we start becoming greedy for everything, we want everything, we see that it blinds us. When we become so material in what we want, we see that we become blind. 
And I really want to close off with this chapter, with this beautiful quote by Gandhi that says that earth provides enough to satisfy every man's needs, right? But not every man's greed. And today, we're seeing all the calamities, natural disasters is because of the sheer greed that makes our minds shrunken. And in the mind, when the mind shrinks, we lose out, not only us, you know, the people around us and society itself. So people like Mahan and other great saints are what we call social reformers. They understand nature, they understand themselves, they understand this whole notion of God, they integrate all of this and try to inspire people to see this goodness of nature and the goodness of the things around us, you know, with a wholesome lens. That wholesome lens can only be, you know, achieved through this spiritual journey of introspection, contemplation, reflection, and meditation. And when we have that wholesome lens, we see that everything has this symbiotic relationship. Whatever we do has an impact. The epicenter of all goodness starts and ends with us. The epicenter of all negativity also starts and ends with us. So ultimately, these Mahans teach us to get to our epicenter and create that universality, the peace, the quietude, the sublimity, so that life becomes, and the spectacular, inspirational thing, so that our life becomes spectacular, inspirational, and awesome. And this is what I learned from my guru. And as I put to practice, you know, life is an awesome journey. 